Welcome to Model Steam Engines Top Tip Time. This is part 5 and this is quite a long video and it's very interesting and quite unusual. The engine on the bench is a twin Stuart 5A that's used in a full size boat but unfortunately the oil supply failed and because of this both of the big ends on both of the connecting rods were destroyed. At the time I was doing this job on behalf of a customer and he didn't really want to go overboard spending a fortune on new parts, so I thought, well, maybe there's a way out of this. It was all down to the state of the crank pins, and they weren't as bad as they look. Yes, they're scored, and they're about 15 thou down on the size they should be, but without doubt, the main problem was the big end brasses, and you can see them here, and they're in the right state. Unlike car engines, on miniature steam engines, the big ends are usually complicated pieces of equipment. Not just half shells that you can drop in. Before I started this job though, I needed to find out why the bearings had failed, and it became apparent when I pressure injected some oil to the centre main bearing, which has an oil way through to each of the crank pins. To my surprise, I found that there was a definite blockage in the oilway, and it was only when I applied some compressed air at quite a high pressure that the blockage cleared. I actually found out what the culprit was. This engine normally lives in a boat, which when it's not in the water is stored in some woodland, and in this woodland there are a lot of leaves, and bits of those would appear to have got into the oil tank somehow. I made this series in 2019 and it was called a special Stuart 5A repair. Taking a close look at the crank pin, it's not really as bad as I thought. Once I cleaned it up a little bit, it looked better. It's about 15 thou undersized, but most of the bearing surface is good. Not perfect, and some of it is scored, but these will become oil grooves. But unfortunately, the big end shells, or the brasses, are diabolical and totally unserviceable. The best way to do this job really would be to dismantle the crankshaft and send it off to be reground, and then make an entirely new set of big end brasses for that particular crank pin. I've spoken to the owner of the engine about this and we've decided to repair it in a different way. The repair starts by tapping in a pair of studs that are just long enough to take two nuts to hold the two halves together. The original studs are far too long because they also hold the connecting rod in place. In this clip I'm tightening up the bolts and the studs are a really good fit in the holes so this will securely hold the two halves of the big end brass together so I can put it in the lathe and machine the centre. Some viewers will be saying, well why not just make an entirely new big end brass? Well, two reasons there. I like to keep original parts where possible and as this is an experimental repair it will take less time to fix it the way I'm doing it than to make an entirely new big end brass. Well, that's the plan anyway. First of all, using a soft hammer, I tap it into place against the three-jaw chuck. And it's not running very truly. But don't forget, this part has been very hot and it's possibly distorted. So as long as the square part of the big end brass is square up against the chuck, boring down the centre is not going to be a problem. And in this clip, I'm now boring down the centre of the big end brass to remove all the damage. And I'm having to take quite a lot of metal away because the grooves in the big end brass are surprisingly deep and it's very badly damaged. Normally when I bore a cylinder or a part like this, what I normally do is use the boring tool to cut through the part and then, without altering the setting, I reverse the direction of the cut so it pulls back the other way. And this gives a better finish and clears out the chips. The next part of the job requires the bandsaw. This is a piece of phosphor bronze and what I'm doing is cutting it to a manageable length so I can put it in the chuck of the Boxford lathe. As the fit on this is very good indeed, the phosphor bronze is exactly the right diameter, so it's time to part this bit off. Now it's time to separate the two half brasses and get ready to solder the pieces of phosphor bronze into position. Some people may be thinking, well, why don't I just make a couple more big end brasses? The reason for doing it this way is in a previous video or two I've shown how to make big end brasses so I'm not going to show it again. This is an alternative method and it's fairly quick and if you think about it, it's a good idea. Because once these brasses get worn beyond economical repair 
I can just repeat this process and make new shells for them. Very similar, I suppose, to big end shells in a car engine, but obviously much, much smaller. And it's more fun making them this way. Now I need to mill away exactly half of the phosphor bronze. I'm using a three quarters of an inch diameter end mill that happened to be in the milling machine at the time. And the idea is to remove exactly half of the phosphor bronze from each of the brasses. The next part of the process is to bolt the brasses back together again and fit them in the three jaw chuck to face each end. This time I've used a couple of 2BA bolts to hold the parts together. And when I fit the joined brasses back into the chuck, I will tap them with the soft hammer to align everything. Here's the facing operation. I'm being very careful not to make a mess of this, so I'm taking very light cuts across the front. When doing this part of the job, it's also important to make sure that the brass is square up against the chuck jaws. That's the square part of the brass, not the round register. And from the initial cleaning out of the damaged part of the brasses, to the facing of the semicircular pieces of phosphor bronze, right through to boring the finished hole in these pieces of phosphor bronze, it's absolutely vital that the square part of this split bearing remains true to the chuck jaws, especially when I come to re-bore the bearing. If the square part of the bearing isn't square, the hole in the middle won't be in the right position and that will cause major problems. The crank pin should be three quarters of an inch in diameter, but it measures just over 15 thou less than that. I'm going to make a plug gauge, which will be exactly the same size as the current crank pin size, and I'm going to use this as a reference. So once I start to machine the big end brasses for this crank pin, I'll be able to test the diameter accurately using the plug gauge. I don't have to make this part. I could use a pair of calipers or a digital caliper or even a special tool to do the job. But this is an easier, simple, foolproof way of doing it. In this clip I'm making some marks at one end of the piece of bar to make sure that I get it the right way around when I use it as a plug gauge. I'm fitting the big end brasses into the chuck and tapping them firmly into place using a soft hammer. It's vital that this hole that I'm going to bore through this blank is exactly at 90 degrees to the square part of the brasses. The round part of the brasses is not accurate. This has suffered from a bit of heat distortion. There are many different ways to do this job, but I've done it this way because I thought it through. During this boring process, I'm not calculating the diameter using the hand wheel verniers. I'm taking very fine cuts and checking the cuts at the beginning of every cut using the plug gauge. And now's the time to try the plug gauge. The fit is perfect, just how I wanted it. It's most important to make sure that this part is the correct dimension. If it doesn't fit on the crank pin perfectly, it will be very difficult to get it to run through in the chuck to remove some more metal. And now it's the moment of truth. I'm separating the two brasses and I'm going to fit them along with the connecting rod to the crank pin. Before I go any further though, I'm pumping some oil from the central journal to make sure it comes through the hole in the crank pin. And it does, it's flowing very freely. With the connecting rod on top of the first brass, and with the numbers that are stamped on the components facing away from me, just like the other side, I can refit the brasses to the crank pin. If you look where the stud comes through the brass, you will see there is no tolerance, it's a tight fit. And it's also a tight fit on the other side, engineering at its best really. In this clip, I'm fitting the nuts that hold the lower brass in place. If you find yourself doing a job like this, I'd just like to mention that it is very important not to over tighten these studs. It isn't a car engine, this is a soft piece of gunmetal. Over tightening these studs will make the gunmetal distort, and the last thing I want at this stage is a tight bearing on this shaft. This bearing will need re running in, and I will readjust the tightness of these studs once I've run the engine for a while. As it turns out though, they're feeling okay. I fitted the lock nuts and here we are. I'm going to start the running in process even before I reassemble the rest of the engine, just by moving the big end bearing back and forth on the crank pin. But I think I can say that the big end repair is a success. The brasses will need tightening after it's done a bit of running, so I'll do that next week. So what's this strange sound? You 
can relax, it's only me testing the drain cocks, and yes, they work fine. And that is it for this episode of Top Tip Time. As I always say, stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.